In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Good morning and welcome to St. Michael's on this sixth Sunday after Trinity. And also a big welcome to Vanessa. And um, thank you very much for playing the organ for us today. And also thank you to Robin for preaching for us. So we continue now with our prayer of preparation as we say together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The collect for today, let us pray. Merciful God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as pass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love towards you that we, loving you in all things and above all things, may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for our readings. A reading from the book of the prophet Amos. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. 
The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will rise again against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very centre of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, earn your bread there and prophesy there. But never again prophesy, prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. This is the word of the Lord. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. <clears throat> in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the richness of his grace that he lavished upon us with all wisdom and insight. He has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance towards redemption of, as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God.
Hear the gospel of the Lord of the Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. King Herod heard of the healing of the sick for Jesus' name and became known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead. And for this reason, some were saying that these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John whom I beheaded has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. An opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. And when his daughter Salome came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? She replied, The head of John the Baptist. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of King the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. The, then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the Gospel of the Lord. May I speak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Mark's Gospel, that I want to focus on this morning, is filled with surprises. At first reading, it appears as if he's written a uh, scattering of random stories. If we were to look more into chapter 6, we would see that in part of it, Jesus has been rejected at Nazareth, he then sends out the twelve, and now we've got the beheading of John the Baptist. And neither of these appear to be, perhaps, in any particular order. But perhaps if we step back for a moment to consider once again the source of Mark's information, and perhaps we, if we were to close our eyes, perhaps we can see in some relaxed and reflective setting, Mark is listening to Peter reminiscing. And quite often when we reminisce, we may not do it in the order in which things necessarily took place. It is not the time or occasion, perhaps, for a disciplined chronology or a tightly woven story. Peter is in the mood of free association in which one memory releases another, perhaps by sequence, but also by connecting words and thoughts. Beginning with the rejection at Nazareth, Peter's mind leaps to make the connection with Jesus' decision to prepare his disciples for leadership if and when he is suddenly removed from the scene. But then you can almost hear Peter saying to Mark, Oh yes, speaking about the threat of death, it was about this time that we heard about the beheading of John the Baptist. As I remember, Jesus mourned John's death and seemed to be sobered by the realisation that he too will become a victim of evil men with political power. In this context, Mark's Gospel escapes the criticism of being a disjointed and undisciplined account of Jesus' life 
Rather, it takes on the character of an artistic happening, filling the pages with the free form of Peter's memory, but joined together by the thread of inspired thought. The, be the beheading of John the Baptist can be read in many ways. You could put your, yourself in the, um, and look through the eyes of one of the characters involved. And we've got John the Baptist, we've got Herod, Herodias, or Salome, the young daughter of Herodias, and therefore the stepdaughter of Herod. We could look through the, the story as one of them. But whichever character you choose to read it through the eyes of, the story is a moral encounter between good and evil in which Jesus sees the persecutor or the precursor of his own death. Sinners may be kings or peasants, but the sins of kings are usually more visible, if not more flagrant. Herod had all, all of the power, the wealth and the privilege of a king. Wives and women are for his asking. Nothing is enough. Herod lusts for his brother's wife in direct violation of the Mosaic law. All it takes is a snap of the royal fingers and she is his but not without its complications. Not only does he violate Jewish law by breaking the code of family trust, but he extends the limits of the ancient taboo against incest. The branches of the Herodian family tree have become so hopelessly entwined that Herod steals his sister-in-law and marries his niece. Sin has been defined as missing the mark of God's will and law. We have all missed the mark at times and have sinned. Herod's sin is more public and blatant than most. Recklessly exercising his power and privilege, he takes dead aim upon every standard of decency and morality. Today, famous people can get away with far less in the public domain than those of us who live a normal, quiet life, whatever we do think is normal or quiet, can be different for different people. God, however, sees all, no matter how famous or not we are. Biblical story is replete with warnings about leaders who sin because they take advantage of their God-given power to challenge God himself. If you think back to the Old Testament, David defies his kingly trust when he has Uriah killed so that he can satisfy his lust for Bathsheba. Solomon succumbs to the sensual influence of his 600 wives and brings idolatry back into the land in direct defiance of God. When I read that, I thought, if I had 600 wives, I don't think I'd have the time to do anything else with my time, I have to say. Balaam rates the uh, title as the mercenary prophet when he tries to manipulate the will of God to serve his own materialistic desires. But then we can contrast the secret of Samuel's greatness by his mother Hannah's prayer of dedication for him at the time of his birth, which says from uh, 1 Samuel, talk no more so exceedingly proudly let not arrogance come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him his actions are weighed. This is a prayer of dedication for all who have the potential to rise to leadership and power. The capacity to be a great saint or a great sinner rises accordingly. Like Samuel, a leader may be, may be honoured for, for humility before God, or like Herod, condemned because of the sin of arrogance. No matter how arrogant the sinner may be, God is faithful to get his attention and arrest him in his sin, and Herod is no exception. Conjecture has it that Herod may have invited John the Baptist for a personal audience at his fortress castle at Maturus. Most prophets would have been flattered and avoided any hint of controversy, perhaps telling the king what they wanted to hear, not perhaps what they needed to hear, but not John the Baptist. He thrusts a bony finger at the red-faced, purple-robed monarch and denounces him for the sin of adultery. With a turn of his thumb, 
Herod could have had him killed on the spot. Instead, at Herodias' urging, he throws John into the famous dungeon of Maturus. And from time to time, then, Herod had the Baptist brought out of the dungeon to hear his message. Mark credits Herod for recognising John the Baptist as a just and holy man. We can also reason that he still has some traces of character and conscience that sin had not yet destroyed. These are the traces, even in the most evil of men, with which God chooses to work. Herod, perhaps, still had hope. If only he had responded to John's call for repentance, as David did after his incident with Bathsheba. We can read in his uh, famous psalm from Psalm 51, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. And of course, rationalisation is part of sinning, justifying what we have done from a standpoint that other people would suggest is not a tenable one. I'm sure there's all times in our lives when we've tried to rationalise or justify something that we have done, that perhaps in hindsight we shouldn't have, or perhaps something that we have failed to do and we're just sort of justifying why we didn't do it when perhaps we should. So when Herod seduced Herodias, while she was still married to Philip, he might have told himself, it doesn't matter, I am above the law. Lesser sinners than me need other excuses, such as, why not, everyone's doing it, or why not, I owe it to myself. Whatever the invented reason, the sinner is selfless, so it is selfish, thinking that other people do not count. Nothing, but of course, can be further from the truth. Sin is like a spider building a web, beginning with a single filament thread after thread is spun and interconnected until the filmy structure forms a world of its own. Sin, like a spider's web, has personal and political alignments which trap us and the people with whom we are associated. Sir Walter Scott famously wrote, Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Herod's web or sin includes entanglements with Herodias' wife and Salome, his stepdaughter. Herodias shares her husband's sin but does, not has, but does not have his ambivalence about the existence of the prophet. She will not rest until John is dead. Perhaps her sin is eating away at her. Perhaps John was a reminder of her sin that she needed to get rid of him perhaps too afraid of him due to the perceived power and influence that he may have had. This reminds me that at times as Christians, we are called to be a light, a light that can be shining in the darkness, the darkness of the sin around us. And sometimes we may be very much in the minority, but that light can shine out. The web of Herod's arrogance and Herodias' vengeance also spins out to snare little Salome. We don't know how old she is, but one perhaps could assume that she is a young teenager. Little does she know about the stakes for which she dances, but once her stepfather promises her anything up to half his kingdom and her hate-crazed mother sees her chance, Salome is pushed into being an accomplice into a senseless crime. If only we would stop long enough to consider the innocents who are always drawn into our sins. To say that if we just follow the crowd or say I did what I was asked does not always cut it. We are called to think for ourselves. Perhaps for little Salome being a child it's a bit different. But those of us who are adults are also called to look out for the younger members, the vulnerable within our society. But even then, Salome, on Judgment Day, she will still have to answer for what she has done. 
Adding to the complications, Herod's sin also has political alignments. We, we, we mustn't forget that he was a great, well, a king and a ruler, perceived by many to be a great king and a great ruler. When Salome returns from her mother asking for the head of John the Baptist, Herod perhaps instantly sobers up and realises the implications of what he has said and promised. His word is on the line, a word that has been broken many times before, and those in his court will have known he will have broken his, many, his word many times previously, but they're probably not daft enough to mention it. But looking around, he sees his public promise in the faces of all his subordinates, all those courtiers and guests at his birthday party. If he backs down now, he will lose his power. Politics, in the end, overrule principle, and the mighty Herod slums and cowers, a victim of his runaway evil. Guilt, like sin, is contagious. It has the capacity for infecting a person physically and psychologically. Herod, despite his dictatorial power and regal wealth, suffers the same agony for his sin. When the news of Jesus' fame as a preacher of repentance and a performer of miracles reaches him, all his guilt springs to the surface in the confession. This is John the Baptist, whom I beheaded. He has been raised from the dead. His agony is written in his words. Not only does he acknowledge John the Baptist as a man like Jesus, bearing good news and doing good deeds, but he personally accepts the responsibility for the beheading, blaming neither Herodias or Salome, nor his lords. Then, with an odd mixture of Jewish theology and pagan superstition, he concludes that Jesus is John the Baptist, risen from the dead, returning to haunt him. Ghosts of sins past inhibit the world of the guilty. John the Baptist loses his head, but Herod has lost his soul. In Herod, Jesus confronts evil at its worst, possessing a man with the potential for greatness, convincing him that he is above the law, entangling him in personal and political alliances from which he cannot escape, causing him to sin far beyond his conscience. Jesus now knows that these same evil forces will be launched against him, not just to soften him up, but in an attempt to destroy him. So perhaps in this week ahead, we can perhaps think about things that we may have done or may not have done. Have we made amends for anything that we feel we need to make amends for? Is there anything that on Judgment Day we can, um, can be, um, come back and fingers can be pointed towards us? Amen. Could we please stand as we declare together our faith in God. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. 
He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for our prayers of intercession. For our leaders who continue to provide spiritual guidance to help us. We pray especially for everyone who organises, leads or assists in church activities. For wise decisions as we come out of lockdown. Lord, in your mercy... Father, we pray that all who lead and advise throughout the world may be led and advised by you, that needs may be noticed and good values upheld and people respected. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for those who long to be free for those who seek asylum and refuge, for those who are sick and in need of prayer, for Murray Hammond, Carol Allen, Ali Millward, Russell Beard, Ken Palmer, Susan Beecham, Judy Wright, Joe Spencer, Babs White, Nona Harrison, Carolyn Johnson, Heather Morgan, Barbara Walton, and Trevor B. And in a moment of quiet, we name in our hearts those known to us. May they all receive your love and strength. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, please make our homes places of love and welcoming to all who visit them and for all who have lost touch with one another and long for reunion. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we commend to your love those who have died. We thank you for lives well lived and love shared. Thank you, Lord, for being there beside us through all the dark and rocky places in our lives. Merciful Father, accept these prayers. For the sake of our Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Would you please stand? We are the body of Christ. In the one spirit we were all baptised into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Please be seated. Blessed be God, by whose grace creation is renewed, by whose love heaven is opened, by whose mercy we offer our sacrifice of praise. Blessed be God for ever. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right. It is our duty and our joy, at all times and in all places, to give you thanks and praise. Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God, 
through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. For he is your living word. Through him you have created all things from the beginning and formed us in your own image. Through him you have freed us from the slavery of sin, giving him to be born of a woman and to die upon the cross. You raised him from the dead and exalted him to your right hand on high. Through him you have sent upon us your holy and life-giving spirit and made us a people for your own possession. Therefore with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Accept our praises, Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And as we follow his example and obey his command, grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us his body and his blood. Who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Therefore, Heavenly Father, we remember his offering of himself, made once for all upon the cross. We proclaim his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. We look for the coming of your kingdom, and with this bread and this cup, we make the memorial of Christ your Son, our Lord. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Accept through him, our great high priest, this our sacrifice of thanks and praise. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of your divine majesty, renew us by your spirit, inspire us with your love, and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing and honour and glory and power be yours for ever and ever. Amen. Let us pray with confidence, as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. 
we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, grant us peace. Jesus is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed. The body and blood of Christ keep you in eternal life. Amen.
Let us pray. God of our pilgrimage, you have led us to the living water. Refresh and sustain us as we go forward on our journey. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. I publish the bands of marriage between Jonathan George Wilcox of this parish and Beverly Clark Claire Wood also of this parish. If any of you know any cause or just impediment why these two persons may be joined together in holy matrimony, ye are to declare it. And this is for the second time of asking. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray for all those who are preparing to be married at this time. Particularly, we remember Jonathan and Beverly. We pray for them in all of their preparations. We pray that they may be happy and live long lives together, in love with each other and those around them, and also growing closer to you. In Jesus' name, Amen. And Lord, at this time we also pray for all of those parents who will be bringing their children for baptism over these next months. Be with them and help them to teach their children in the ways of Jesus Christ. And we pray that they will bring them to church so that together we may grow in love with you. In Jesus' name, Amen. And so, um, some notices. You probably know that Bishop Nick has uh, retired, but we are actually asking people um, to give some money that we can send on to him. He's actually still in the diocese for another few weeks. Um, we're a bit late in asking for this collection. But if you would like to uh, give some money towards um, Bishop Nick and his retirement, then please either see me or speak to the office. Um, you can leave it here um, if it's in a specific envelope so we know um, that it's to go towards that collection. Um, see me afterwards if you want to know what to do about that. I also wanted to mention that today is Sea Sunday. Um, for those of you who ever listen to my radio talk afterwards, which is on, um, on our website, um, I'm talking about Sea Sunday. And so the collection for that is um, for the mission to seafarers who do an enormous amount of work um, to help those at sea. And as you can imagine, their lives are very difficult at the moment, um, not, not knowing where they can get off and when they can get home. Those at sea are always away a long time from family, but obviously at the moment not getting to see babies being born or loved ones um, who've passed away. So it's, um, it, it's a great charity, and if you feel able to... Um, donate to that then again um, see me but it's basically go online uh, for missions to seafarers.com I think as soon as you put it into your internet they'll, it will tell you where it is um, just remember to stay in your seats until someone comes and tells you you can go and raise your hands at the end of the service and drop your service sheets in the box on your way out and I don't think it says it on here, but just a reminder that on the 31st of July, there are some cream teas and a cake stall, book stall and toys and game stall and a raffle, oh gosh, um, in the parish centre. And you need to contact Roe 
um, if you want to be involved. Or, oh, hang on, that's if you want to help run it. Oh, that's an exciting challenge for you. Um, if you'd like to go, um, I assume you tell the parish office. Is that right, Cyril? Well, of course, you might not need to tell anybody by that time, as Cyril has um, rightly said. But I will reiterate that um, in church, we will be putting some more chairs back in. Um, but if you want to wear your masks, please wear them. I'll, I'll probably keep mine on for a, a little bit of the service. Um, and, and we're going to go very cautiously. So please don't feel that um, you don't want to come in case uh, we're going straight back to the way things were. We're, we're going to take it easy. So be assured of that. Anybody else got um, any news notices? No. Okay, fine. Thank you. So now, if you please stand for the dismissal and blessing. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be with you and all those you love and care for, and remain with you always. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ. Thanks be to God.